chances to see each other's faces in 2020. So um, I want to start by thinking about my first impression of Teresa and when she joined the Bennington program and just so deeply thoughtful and sincere. And we both had this sort of secret business consulting double life. Um, <laughs> and, um, and I remember being fascinated when I realized this woman was a vault of interesting experiences. Um, and, and so to me, getting this book in my hands was actually sort of thrilling because Teresa's never going to be the one that talks too much at the lunch table, you know, so getting to crack open your memoir was actually sort of thrilling that way and feeling like there was going to be access to these parts of you that were so interesting and complex. Um, Teresa, did you want to say anything just to welcome or, or start things off before we jump into questions? Yeah, no, I'm just um, really grateful to be here. Thank you, everybody, for bearing with the technical difficulties. And many thanks to Kat and Max um, for, and Consequence for sponsoring this and to Megan for agreeing to interview me. Uh, it's just really awesome to be here. So thanks. Excellent. Um, I was thinking earlier this evening about a Mary Carr quote on on memoir and she was she says something like what hurts so bad isn't the butt whippings that the world delivers but it's the stupid hopes and I was sort of thinking about that with with a with this memoir because I think you know the the expected version would be the butt whipping version the extreme physicality the intensity that you went through in your training and your experience but I think actually what's most devastating and profound in this book to me are the hopes, you know, and, and the character change and the things that you go through. Um, years ago, when you looked at the landscape of military narratives and what was, what was out there in the landscape and what you'd read and what was familiar sort of in our literary world, um, what did you feel like was missing? Sure. Um, so historically, military narratives, especially in the US, have been this binary of either your Captain America, kind of Hollywood, American sniper, sort of like white male combat vet, um, maybe junior officer kind of trope, or your like Demi Moore in G.I. Jane, which came out when I was a teenager and which for decades was what um, Americans would say when they saw a woman trying to join the military. And I felt like that's just way too much of a black and white way to view things, that there's a much more nuanced view that can be taken of military service and a much more nuanced view that can be taken of gender in context with the military. Like now, you know, we have this buzzword, um, toxic masculinity. Well, then the kind of opposite of that seems to have been tender masculinity recently and men being able to show emotion and women being able to show strength, especially in the past few years after the Me Too movement. And so I think, now, over the past 15 years, especially as more veterans are writing about their experience from a number of different perspectives, an entire spectrum of gender expressions and an entire spectrum um, intersecting like race, sexuality, position in the military, job in the military, it's not all combat, it's not all combat arms, it's not all going house to house or like arresting people or bayoneting people. Um, and so I think that has given a lot more richness to the landscape of military literature in the past 15, 20 years or so. Yeah, thank you. And yeah. so there's the, there's the actual experience in the military, but I think there's this next step from there that you took, which is deciding to share your story. And so could you talk to us about um, what, what are the you know possibly unique burdens or expectations a female writer carries with her in sharing this sort of story as a book or as a memoir? Sure, absolutely. Um, so I guess, and you know, to start, that goes also into uh, what it takes to join the military as a woman. Noting that there's many different ways to be a woman in the military. Full stop. There's many different ways to be a woman. Full stop. And so, no one woman's experience is the experience of all women. You know. I'm speaking for myself and as I've written and shared my story, I've, I've met a lot of people who have had similar experiences, but many folks have had experiences either 180 degrees off from me or somewhere in between. Sorry, it's the engineer coming out. Um, 
So yeah, but but there are some unique burdens uh, in sharing your story when you're a member of a, a particular minority in the military and in the Marine Corps, women are only, I think maybe we're close to 9% of the Marine Corps now. When I was in, we were maybe more like 7% of the Marine Corps. So you're surrounded by 93% dudes um, almost the entire time. And so there is this very strong pressure to like not make all women look bad. Um, whatever you do, you know, whether you like it or not, it looks like you're representing the rest of the minority uh, that you're part of. And this is true for many minorities in many different fields, whether they're like um, gender minorities or sexual orientation minorities or racial minorities. You know, they take that one person they might have seen in their whole career who happens to be this way and people use it to extrapolate to the whole. So. When entering the military, women a lot get told, well, you're either a bitch, a dyke, or a hoe. And unfortunately, that has been sort of the, the limiting ways to be a woman in the military for decades and decades. And it doesn't need to be that way anymore. And our generation of women veterans is speaking out a lot and saying that it, it doesn't need to be that way. There's many different ways to be a whole and valid person in the military. But I think coming in, there was a lot of pressure to not rock the boat, to um, you know, present yourself as uh, as well as you could, kind of perfectionist, kind of zero defect mentality um, are often the burdens, like you must absolutely look perfect. Uh, I had a, a friend in elementary and middle and high school and even, you know, in her, she lived with a single mom and, you know, two women in the house and in their guest bathroom was the the old, like a sign with this old like trope, like, uh, a woman must do a job twice as good as a man to be thought half as good. And then there was this little, you know, 1980s joke, like, fortunately, this is not difficult, which was cute. But what must it be like to be a young girl seeing that every single day in your home bathroom? I mean, I remember going in there and being like, wow, that's kind of laying it on thick. And so, but I think we, we come in with all of these burdens just from the culture at large that when you're surrounded by people who are not in your same minority, um, there's a lot of pressure to not show any flaws or not you know, show uh, anything that might reflect poorly on you or on the rest of the women in the unit. Yeah. When, when I think of some of the, you know, it's been, I think, 15 years maybe since you, you started this part of your life and as you've referenced in earlier questions and your answers to earlier questions the you know the language has been shifting our perspective and and the many ways that that people can express themselves um, in this realm has shifted um, I've been thinking a lot about feminine leadership I think for so much of my life and sort of getting back to this bathroom question you were talking about about you know having to do it twice as good or having to emulate a traditionally masculine form of leadership. How has, I just had a cat join me, how is your, um, <laughs> how has your view on, on feminine leadership shifted over time, if at all? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, in a few different ways. Uh, so the, the most recent way actually has been, I got the chance to go to Sweden in 2018 and report on their change to gender neutral conscription. So they've started drafting 18 year old young women as well as young men. Um, and that was fascinating because they've had women in combat arms, women in all different sorts of occupational specialties since the 1980s. They just opened everything up. And so I got the chance to meet uh, these really badass women who were like admirals and colonels in the Swedish military, whose leadership style was not, it was, it was not like you took Captain America or some like Arlie Ermey the Gunny from Full Metal Jacket and just like put a wig on him. It was not like that. Um, they were strong, but they were all, they also had this emotional intelligence about them. And I've met male leaders with emotional intelligence too, but it was really cool um, talking to the Swedes and just hearing about the way that they raise their young boys and, and their young girls. And yes, there is sexism there. That was one thing I did report on. They were in the midst of this, um, this military Me Too movement also which was fascinating to me because I had always thought Sweden was the land of like Ikea, lingonberry pancakes and gender neutrality always. Um, and it's not the case, but they do a really good job. Um, they had uh, Margot Wallstrom, their foreign minister a few years ago, developed what she called a feminist foreign policy. And it sounds just like common sense, like have parental leave, like fund, you know, uh, countries give money to mothers and women so they can raise children who will grow up to be, you know, to have jobs or to make a difference in the world um, instead of having to become radicalized. Uh, 
because they haven't had opportunities growing up. So that relationship to power and power as something that can be shared um, instead of something that has to be wielded hierarchically one over another, uh, I think is a hallmark of an expanded form of leadership that I would love to see more of in the world. Uh, along those lines, the second thing that has expanded my view of leadership actually has been watching a lot of my friends become parents. Um, I'm at an age where most of my friends are parents of small children. Uh, that is the reason why many of them are not on the call tonight because now is bedtime. But um, watching you know, my female friends become mothers and have to wield authority in a way that you don't when you're like in your 20s and early 30s and just like out and about having a good time. Uh, watching my male friends become fathers and having them be far more emotionally invested in their children than um, folks of say my dad's generation and my grandparents' generation were. Uh, and really like watching them do a really intimate job of raising these small people, I think, uh, has totally expanded my view of what leadership can be because parenthood is is leadership at the heart of it. You're raising a little small being there. Um, so I think that is definitely expanded my view of, uh, of what a, a leader is um, and what power is in the past 15 years. Yeah, what a gorgeous answer. I think um, I want to replay that for my daughters. <laughs> when they come back over from the isolation that I imposed. <laughs> They're exile. Well, <laughs> they are. Um, so I have to admit, when I think about um, the military and, and the experience you must have encountered 15 years ago when things were, you know, uh, much further back from this expansive form of leadership and gender expression and emotional intelligence that you're sort of, you know, looking at now, I think about this, this sense of being um, a prescribed way of being in the world and behaving and was that a barrier for you when you had to step into to more of an authentic self to write a memoir? Like, what did it take for you to sort of lean into authenticity and owning your power? And I imagine there was some change that had to occur. And I feel like you track it in the book as well. But can you kind of speak to what, what that took? Yeah, sure. No, absolutely. Um, as a as a midshipman in ROTC and as a very junior officer, you know, you're under a tremendous amount of stress. And so you kind of default to what is the easiest and most straightforward and black and white thing that I can do in this moment. And um, that, you know, what people often do when they're in those training environments or when they're very junior is just default to what is the baseline standard? What is the, you know, when, when we were doing our, our little practice attacks at the basic school or officer candidate school, the easiest thing to do would be a straightforward attack from the front. You're firing your little blanks and, and we used to call it hated a little straight up the middle. All you do is, is just what you've been told to do and there's no room for imagination. Um, there's not much room for being your authentic self unless your authentic self, you know, it just likes to hammer on other people all day long, which plenty of folks do. Um, and so as you become a junior leader, you know, you see a few more different types of situations. You see a few more opportunities for judgment calls and sometimes you make the right call, sometimes you make the, the wrong call. I was very lucky to have um, pretty good leaders around me. Uh, I had my first few bosses were, uh, were great and kind of took me under their wing. I was also lucky to have a really good senior enlisted around me, which not every junior lieutenant gets. And so part of their job also was kind of coaching in a way that doesn't sound like coaching because they're a lot older and more experienced than you, but technically you're in charge. It's, it's this weird dynamic. Um, but I had really good folks around me kind of helping me learn the ropes of how to make those judgment calls and how to be a leader. And I didn't always get it right. And I outline a few places in the memoir where I felt particularly useless, like many young second lieutenants do. Um, and so as I grew and had to become more authentic, uh, that really didn't start until I got out of the military. You know, I was off active duty as a first lieutenant, got promoted to captain in the individual ready reserve. Um, and uh, that was during a period of time where I was in my mid to late 20s and just figuring out how to be an adult human without this whole scaffolding of military power and hierarchy telling me how to be in the world all the time. And it was a huge shift because I had to go from 
you know, acting like effectively a teenage boy with some authority uh, to acting like a young woman. Um, and I didn't really know how to do that. I was very lucky to have really good friends in New York City who kind of helped me learn all of those things. Um, and they were just really fantastic and, and caring and emotionally open uh, in a way that I had not been with my friends a whole lot before. Um, there are some friends I've had since you know, childhood and high school and college who were finding things out about me in the memoir because I just didn't tell them um, when I was younger. I didn't feel like I had the emotional space to. And so to start writing about these experiences, that took a, that was a very long journey. Um, it took, I, I got an entirely different graduate degree in a completely different field before I felt comfortable uh, putting whatever I had experienced in Iraq, in the Marine Corps and after down on paper. Um, took a lot of, you know, emotional evolution, a lot of personal growth work uh, and um, just learning to be my authentic self. And at first I was uh, kind of dancing around putting these things to paper, you know, digging out my old journals and being like, well, maybe I'll just write some fiction. I'll just write a few short stories and, you know, I'll, I'll pass it off. Like those are stories that should be told, but no, can't write about this whole relationship thing. Nope. Can't write about that. And pretty soon it was the only thing I could write about. It was the only thing I could think about and I had to do it as nonfiction. Um, and ripping off the bandaid of publishing my first piece about that, um, which I guess go big or go home wound up in the New York times. Uh, it was like ripping a Band-Aid off, and it was absolutely terrifying. Um, I thought I was going to lose my job, which I had no basis for. Work was completely fine about it. Uh, I thought I was going to lose all my friends and lose all my family and, and all of that. Uh, and by and large, people have been pretty cool. Um, that, uh, you know, sort of opening that up opened a window into being more authentic. Uh, and I think my conversations with both loved ones and strangers have deepened as a result. So. Yeah, I think um, one of the best lessons I teach writers when I'm working with undergraduates or graduates is talking about how early on in our reading and writing lives, we're introduced to good guys and bad guys. But as we move into more literary forms and adult thinking, it's actually about the hybrid of those two things that we all inevitably are and, and how um, a memoir, I think, or an effective memoir, which yours is, requires us to really embrace the moral complexity of our lives and our decision making. And can you talk about how that process functions for you and, and the way you wrote this book? Sure. Um, yeah, it developed, it, it required me to develop a lot of compassion just for everybody involved in the book. Um, which was tough because there were a lot of facets that as a, a very young person, say when I was experiencing those things seemed very black and white to me. And then as I grew, um, you know, in retrospect, especially trying to take on the perspectives of some of those other people or hearing their perspectives, um, I had to develop a lot of compassion for them. So certainly members of my family and my parents, I have uh, even during the writing of the book, changed my relationship with for the better to understand more of their perspective of where they were coming from when I was a small child um, and what was happening in the adult world when I was seeing it from a child's vantage point. Uh, similarly, the people I served with in the Marine Corps, the, the Marla character evolved over the seven years it took me to write the book as I did a lot more reading on my own, as I witnessed and had more conversations with female friends. Um, and as I developed more compassion for what it's like to be, you know, to, to embrace one's gendered power and sexual agency as a woman in America. And it's really, really hard if you're in this very hierarchical warrior-like male dominant male dominated environment. It's near impossible and it's what puts women in that double or triple bind um, that is, is so hard about being a heterosexual woman in a place like the Marine Corps, even today, as we've seen from the Marines United scandal of a few years ago. So uh, other folks I've had to, you know, develop compassion for, uh, the Jack character who, you know, you, you see by the epilogue, I won't spoil it for everybody, but, um, you know, really uh, it took me aging into the age where he was when I met him. And doing that math, you know, now as somebody 15 years after the fact, thinking like, oh, this is what that must have felt like. You know, having close friends um, 
who are my age now going through divorces with children and being like, oh, now I get it. And there was, when I started writing the book, there was absolutely no way I could have had the perspective to have that compassion. It took me actually living it alongside people who were going through similar experiences from the perspectives of the characters in the book. Um, and, and so that, that took some time and some living. It's an argument for writing slowly, which I guess I'm glad for. Um, it, it means the time it took to take the book, which was con to finish the book, which was considerable, was not a waste. So I guess that's good. Um, but yeah, it, it required developing a lot of compassion for not just myself, but everyone else involved. Yeah, I think that's probably a pretty good segue for us to possibly let you read. I think um, oh, sure. you know that I have a favorite scene in the book. Um, and I, I think it you know, kind of speaks to this moral complexity, but also your skill as a writer in the way that you hold us in some discomfort and scene. And so I'd love to just hear you read for a little. Sure, no, thank you. Um, and this is actually the first Zoom reading I've gotten to do. So if you don't have it already, here's what the book looks like. Um, and, uh, and yeah, it's funny because when Megan originally told me you know, she, this was her favorite scene and she wanted me to read that. I was like, oh my God, this is gutting. I don't know if I can get through this, but, um, but I've, I've looked at it. I practiced, Megan, I can, I can do it. So thanks for picking something super painful. Love you special. Um, but the, uh, what folks need to know about this scene, uh, it is at the Marine Corps birthday ball or one of two that is featured in the book, um, which is a ceremonial ball. And uh, the um, Jack character is the love interest of myself in the book. And Marla is another female lieutenant. And I think that is all you really need to know at this point. Um, but it's on page 142 for the folks at home if you happen to be following along, no pressure. The Oak Club lobby teamed with Marines wearing gilded medals, high leather neck collars above, swords swinging below. Marla disappeared to chat with some other officers. I headed for the bar in order to Sam Adams. Behind me, I heard the slow pock pock of shoes on polished tile. A familiar voice boomed, are you old enough to be buying that beer? I might be, I said, turning around to face a chest full of shiny metal, Gulf War, global war on terrorism, Bronze Star. My first time seeing Jack in dress blues. Hey, he said, hey. I'll just be a minute, he said, hustling down the hall and ducking into a small conference room. Marla was in the doorway. She motioned me over, jerked her head inside. When I looked in, I saw a photographer snapping a posed photo, Jack and his wife flanked by flags. She was 10 years older than me, tall and elegant. She wore a silver Cinderella ball gown and elbow length gloves, platinum blonde hair piled high and ornate. Ringlets cascaded past her eyes. In her satin heels, she was only slightly shorter than Jack. He stood stiffly, bracing one arm around her waist. He did not smile as the flash erupted. My stomach felt like lead, and I muttered, you gotta be fucking kidding me. I was jealous, of course. She was gorgeous. But I also judged him for preferring her. He wanted some princess in a ball gown and stilettos, mincing down the hall. I'd never be her. Here I was, in my sensible uniform skirt, low heeled shoes, and Harry Potter haircut. A few medals, sure, some silver bars on my epaulets, but if who he really wanted was the bell of the ball, well, that would never be me. I was a warrior. There's so much I admire about that scene. I, it just stayed with me long after I read the book. I think it was your attention to sound quality and then the cinematic, you know, moments of like metal flashing. And I think it's also the way the reader can feel your gaze of you looking into this room and kind of what I, what I launched the call with, that feeling of hope um, and reality and that dissonance and, and that tension is so heartbreaking and so real and, um, and heady. And, and I just love, I love the noise, the emotional noise and the physical noise of that scene. Um, and, and just that true note that you strike right through it. Um, it's just my favorite. Thanks. I would not recommend yeah. living it, at least not more than once, <laughs> if you have the choice, you know. But yeah. <laughs> so sorry to make you have a public living it moment of that. Um, you know, I guess that's what being a memoirist is about. So <laughs> thanks. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, what would you like to see in terms of 
um, the writing that's out there. I mean, I wonder if from your perspective, is it nuanced enough? Is it inhabited by enough different perspectives? You know, what, what would you really like to see as far as, as, as military writing and the literary landscape goes? Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's getting more nuanced, but there's definitely still some room, um, plenty of room actually for more perspectives. So we still see disproportionately uh, folks who are male, white, combat arms, um, mostly junior officers is like the joke of like every company great officer comes back, writes a memoir, and I guess I'm guilty of that too. But we definitely need more voices out there. Um, certainly many more women's stories to be told. Definitely more folks of color too. Most of the memoirists we've seen, um, with just a few exceptions, have been white. Uh, many more um, LGBTQ memoirs need to be written and just different experiences. So not all combat arms or like scenes of combat, but exploring more things like moral injury, which my book also does talk about. Um, there are a few folks who've explored different, you know, types of sexuality, whether in war zones or out. Um, coming of age is a huge thing because so many of us join the military so young. And so you're fundamentally, you are coming into your adulthood at the same time when you're doing something like fighting a war, um, which has been the case for, for generations. I mean, I remember reading Vietnam War memoirs and like, yeah, those 19 year olds are the same age as my Marines were back then. Um, so there, there's still plenty more to be done. Like it's, it's not all just combat. It's um, plenty more stories to be told. And I realized like as a, you know, white cis het person, my job a lot of times is to pass the mic. So, you know, there's definitely plenty more people's stories. Um, plug for Consequence and other literary magazines that deal with horror. I mean, folks are, are taking submissions and I know at other events, We've gotten questions about where to submit to, too, but uh, I think there's plenty more stories to be told, in short. I agree. I, I, on that note, Martha Felch has a question for you and um, is wondering how you found the time and concentration to write a memoir at such an early life stage. Oh, thank you. Um, and bless you for calling my stage right now an early life stage as I feel old many days. But uh, yeah, I, you know, part of it's maybe the Marine training. I don't know. I um, started writing it when I had a full-time day job. Um, it was maybe one or two jobs before the one that uh, Megan alluded to when I started the MFA, but um, I just felt like the story was in there beating to get out, and I uh, would just block off time. I would get home from work and eat dinner and then like sit on the couch and relive my deployment for a few hours a night, and uh, while that wasn't pleasant, it was definitely cathartic, I guess. Um, there was an entire summer also where I just decided I, I had a few pieces to write that I really wanted to, and I just decided that I was going to um, get up at five in the morning for most of that summer and spend 45 minutes writing, and that's what I did. Um, another thing that really helped was on a few weekends, I would do things like get in the car. I lived in New York City, so and I owned a car, which was an immense privilege, but uh, I would hop in my car and drive up to, say, the Catskills or, um, you know, uh, mid-Hudson Valley and just find a campsite and, and write. And sometimes it took getting out of my apartment, getting out of my regular lifestyle in order to be able to do that. Um, so carving out that space was incredibly important. Uh, I was lucky through most of the time to be uh, of writing this to, you know, I, I don't have kids yet, so that might have helped. I, but, uh, but if you need to, like plenty of parents write also. So it's just about carving the time. Um, I would just tell myself, you know, tonight I just have to make one sentence better. And it's sort of the Anne Lamott bird by bird thing um, that, uh, you know, just make one sentence better and you do that enough times and you have a few paragraphs and you do that enough times, you have a few pages and it kind of snowballs from there. Great. Another question from the group. Um, someone saying, my correct recollection of military service was the absolute top-down approach to decision-making. Uh, this, this person says they've heard through the grapevine that this is changing. Is there a sense in U.S. armed forces that officers are opening up to querying their subordinates and using um, more modern management approaches to military leadership? Yeah, I mean, not always, um, you know, and clearly I don't speak for the entire military. And to be clear, I've been out of the Marine Corps. I've been off active duty since 2006. So it's been a little while. Uh, but recognizing, um, I've seen this a little bit more in the uh, sort of technical innovation realm where um, 
taking a page from the Silicon Valley model, there are now sort of competitions where young, say, airmen or soldiers and sailors and Marines are asked like, hey, how would you solve this problem? Uh, we used to call it like the, the E4 mafia, like the, all the corporals mafia or like the Lance Corporal grapevine or something like that. Like they know, you know, you need something, ask a Lance Corporal to do it and don't ask him or her how he did it, but, uh, but they will get stuff done. Um, so you kind of know that your troops know what they're doing anyway. Uh, and so solving problems on a practical level becomes a matter of like, all right, just give the order and they'll find a way to do it. Just don't micromanage. I think people are maybe more open about acknowledging it um, then. I know, you know, sometimes if I needed a problem solved, like, yeah, I'd ask my gunny or, you know, my, my non-commissioned officers, like, okay, go solve this. And as long as they weren't doing anything illegal, like, it didn't really matter how that problem got solved. Um, I think when you're also a junior leader, it's much easier to ask questions because you don't have to save as much face because everybody expects you to know very little. So one of the things I tried to do um, was, you know, in, in the early afternoons, just sort of like troop around the compound, like, hey, what you doing? How does that work? And like, it's not weird if your second lieutenant needs to like crawl under a Humvee and be like, point to something like, what is that? Um, and the troops are, are quite happy to, to tell you. So that, you know, I don't know if that's more or less popular than it used to be. Uh, you know, certainly when you're talking like 50, 60 years ago, I imagine society was a lot more top down also. So there might be some generational components to that. Another question from the group um, says, you mentioned being influenced by the art of Alma Leva. I wonder why you made a connection with her installations that display a very quiet, intimate space. I wonder if the space gave you a kind of permission to speak about your relationship with Jack. That's really interesting. Um, so no, uh, this, this reader is very astute in that uh, I referenced, uh, one of my short stories was inspired by the work of Alma Leva, um, who I was incredibly lucky to meet. We were both at a residency in upstate New York called Yaddo uh, in 2015. And she does this incredible work um, about Honduran gangs and the violence they inflict. But the way that she does it is by making these uh, life-size dioramas of say, uh, a home altar to somebody who's been murdered by a gang or like a, a little league type soccer uniform uh, that's been soaked in blood from a, a kid who's been a, you know, shot or stuff like that. Or, um, you know, uh, a church scene, something like that. And then she'll take a picture of it. So it's these incredibly haunting, moving, intimate photographs of largely domestic scenes, but there's, you know, they're sort of tinged with, um, with violence. And I was very affected by that. And one of my short stories protagonists, actually she's wound up being the protagonist in a couple of my short stories, uh, is from, um, is inspired by those types of scenes. Uh, so I, I don't think it's a direct connection, but I think what resonated with me in that was taking somebody who on a personal level um, was having you know, so much trouble or so much profound change and then layering on the military aspect to that. So what happens when there's so much going on for you inside, but on the outside, you're not allowed to really talk about it. And I think that's a similarity in both mine and Alma's work. Um, and I admire her immensely. She's done a whole lot of really tremendous stuff. Thank you. Um, a question here from uh, a listener who says, what is the process of writing been like for you in dealing with sporadic trauma over the course of your deployment? Yeah, uh, well, how to answer that? I mean, it's, it's hard, right? So trauma, trauma is a tricky thing because so many of us join the military because of or with trauma playing into that decision. Um, so I, I like to quote this study, it's from 2014, it's the Journal of the American Medical Association, and they looked at people who had joined the military, um, both men and women, during the draft era, so pre, you know, the 1970s when the draft was ended, and then in the era of the all-volunteer military, um, so afterwards. And in men who had been subject to the draft, um, in, in women, you know, their rates of trauma were about the same. They surmised because, you know, before women who had, had found trauma, you know, they hadn't been compelled to join the military, but uh, they joined it uh, sometimes as a way to escape a home life that was not ideal. Uh, and they found that for men, um, they were profoundly more likely to have four or more adverse childhood experiences, such as parental uh, incarceration, child abuse, parental divorce, mental illness, 
things like that um, prior to joining the military. And they hypothesized that joining the military for them was a way to gain power and to gain structure. Um, so for me, you know, my childhood was not ideal and parts of it are in the book. And I joined the military both as a way to pay for college, but also because it connotes this sort of power. It's like, okay, well, they might be screaming at me. And yeah, it was like that at home too, but at least in the military, the rules make sense. And there's a reason that you're, that you're getting screamed at. There's a reason for the discipline. There's a reason for the toughness and it makes you tough as a result. Um, so I think a lot of people who have undergone trauma or childhood experiences like that uh, join the military as a way to kind of overcome that. You kind of run into the belly of the beast. Um, so in that realm, like the traumas I dealt with in the military were just kind of like more of the same. I assumed they would also give me tools to come out of that, which um, is, you know, the military is doing a better job now of trying to pay attention to resilience. Resilience is definitely something that needs more attention, both in and out of the military. Um, the work of Dr. Kate Hendricks Thomas has been instrumental in helping that out. She's a fellow former Marine officer. Um, she writes about, uh, she calls it bulletproofing the psyche about mental resilience training. Um, so the decision to, to write about that trauma, I think, was really what helped me overcome it. Uh, and, you know, like therapy and things like that too can be incredibly helpful uh, in, in helping one deal with those sorts of traumas. Um, you know, it's, it's something that happens in the military and I think the sooner that one addresses the trauma and the cause of it and the situations leading up to it and the events themselves, uh, the sooner one can actually move past it. I know during the years where I was like just trying to run away from it, I became more and more unhappy. Um, and it was when I finally decided to admit, like, there were, I was profoundly unhappy. And this is in the book, too, actually, a, a friend who was still in the military, a friend in my grad program was like, dude, you are not okay. Like, go talk to somebody. It's cool. Um, and his advice was the one I took to, like, finally seek help and kind of turn around and, and face that beast. Um, I'm not sure if that actually answers the question this person was asking, but that that is what I can say about trauma, the decision to serve, and then the decision to get over the trauma afterwards. Uh, April Darcy would thank like to thank you for your beautiful reading, but also is curious about what you are working on next. Oh, thanks. Yeah, no, um, I am working on fiction. Uh, as I alluded to when talking about the short story protagonist, I do have a bunch of short stories that I've uh, been working on actually since my time at Bennington, which I'm hoping to pay more attention to now. Um, so they're mostly linked short stories about women in the military. Uh, we'll see if they expand to, to include other things. Excellent. Um, we have another person who is interested in how you decided to structure your memoir and did it change while you were writing? Yeah, um, the, it, it changed a bit. So, and actually, um, not to plug, put in a huge plug for Bennington, but that was very helpful. Um, I started with the entire memoir in the present tense which people would read it and they'd be like, well, this is good, but man, this is exhausting to read. Uh, and it turns out you can do a lot more like time dilation wise and flashback wise if you just like start out um, or at least have most of your book in the past tense. And so that structure um, changed insofar as I could rearrange things to flash forward for certain paragraphs. Uh, and kind of foreshadow a bunch of things, and then um, flashback. So this scene's back in childhood. Clearly, the book is not entirely chronological. Uh, it was mostly chronological from the beginning, but um, but yeah, actually, uh, the experience of getting an MFA and having like professional authors be like, "Hey, look at all of these tools in the toolbox you could do if you just change, you know, this structure here and there." Um, that was quite helpful, and uh, other writers gave me good advice. Um, in that way to, uh, you know, I'd, I'd be describing these experiences in great detail and they're like, well, that's great, but like, you know, tie it up for us a little, like, what, what did you actually get out of this? You know, uh, please have it trending towards, towards something positive or else it's just all trauma all the time. So, um, you know, that advice of people was quite helpful in, in making things uh, as structured and hopefully satisfying as they could be for the reader. Thank you. Lots of questions coming in, Teresa, so. Cool. Um, <laughs> Here's another. Here. You sound as if you value your time spent as a Marine and a young leader. Considering the definition of Fidelis as ever faithful, do you find yourself conflicted between being an ever faithful Marine and writing about these experiences you had while deployed? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, Fidelis is a, a very useful title um, because, you know, it's, it's are you being faithful to your own moral code? Are you being faithful to the moral code of the military? Um, does that change? You know, are you being faithful to your unit, the person you're in love with? And most of all, can you be faithful to yourself when you have these experiences? So absolutely, it's pretty scary to release a memoir like this. Um, parts of me still think, well, maybe I'm making all women in the military look bad. Like, I don't know. Uh, you know, there are, there are so many of us and there are so many of us with different experiences. Um, you know, the, the UCMJ says one thing, and many people would argue that it is steeped in the 1950s and badly needs changing, especially in the realm of gender dynamics. Um, and, uh, I, you know, parts of you would have to agree with that. And I think the more authentic I am, the more that I tell the absolute truth as I have seen it about my experience, uh, the better that it will be because other people can know if they've had similar experiences, they're not alone. So the most powerful responses I've gotten to things I've written about what happened when I was overseas and the aftermath have been other uh, female service members coming up to me and being like, hey, that thing you wrote about, you're not the only one. Like plenty of us have had those experiences too and nobody talks about it. And so if this can save one other young woman from feeling like she's incredibly alone and the worst person in the world and making everybody uh, around her look bad who's of her gender because she has had one illicit experience, then the book has done its job. It's already done its work for me, um, but what I'm trying to do is prevent other people from being so alone with their pain if they felt anything similar. Beautiful. Um, and I think that also gets to one of the questions that the group had about the title. I think you just spoke um, pretty well about, about that. And looking at the time, uh, we probably need to wind down and I, I had one final question of my own, which is, you know, sort of tying it to our, our current moment, which is, what does service or love of country really mean right now, either for you personally or the public narrative around service? Can you speak to that? Yeah, sure, absolutely. And um, and in 2020 is quite the year to be talking about service too. I mean, you know, aside from the the election, our, our planet and our country literally on fire, widespread protests. There are so many ways to serve, um, you know, not to mention in this era of global pandemic, we have all our medical personnel on these front lines still serving as people are still sickening and dying. So I think in terms of service, there's many, many different ways to serve one's country. Uh, it doesn't all have to be in the military. You know, there's an argument for national service in there, whether it's military or AmeriCorps, Teach for America, you know, conservation types of work, um, community volunteerism. I think civilians and, and veterans, people may argue with me about this, but are actually uh, more alike than not. Civilians turn into service members who turn into veterans, who turn into, you know, civilians who are helping out in their communities. Um, so I think service is a very multifaceted thing. Um, absolute respect for people who have worn the uniform and at the same time, absolute respect for those ER doctors who are helping people become healthy and breathe right now. Uh, for firefighters who may not have worn a military uniform but are trying to save lives out west at this very moment. I mean, I think as an American, um, it's important to continue serving in whatever capacity you can. And like, look, if your service right now is picking up an extra can of green beans for your local food bank, that's awesome. More power to you. Like, there's many different ways. We don't need to fetishize um, veterans uh, for, for serving. So, um, yeah, man, I, there are so many different directions I can go uh, with that question, but service does, it, it just means continually trying to work for the good. And if that means parenting your child in a loving and compassionate manner versus, you know, being an authoritarian and smacking them around, like that's service because everything, everybody else that kid is gonna interact with uh, is gonna be the better for that, that compassionate love and parenting. Um, I mean, it's, it's aligning yourself um, with the highest good for your fellow humans and for the planet. So it doesn't all have to be from behind the sights of an M16. Profound, gorgeous, amen to that. Kat, I'll let you close us down. 
I will. And I want to thank Teresa for answering the questions honestly and, and, and artic in a very articulate fashion. And Megan, thank you for asking the questions and bringing all of this together, and especially that last question about the, the good. Um, we can all focus on the good. One of the goods, buy the book. Go to bookshop, go to your bookstore, support Consequence. Um, and just in general, enjoy everything. I'm so happy that everyone came together for this evening. And thank you for bearing with us through our technical difficulties. Thank you and so long from Consequence. Bye. Thanks.